find someone you can rely on, ask them for help, or even suggestingly joke <laughs> they could help you with it. And you'd be surprised. I mean, it starts a journey that you could never imagine where it would land. This podcast encourages and empowers you to create your own unique real story, develop your own unique real statement, and discover your own unique real self. The power is yours. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Andy Bree. How are you doing on this wonderful, beautiful afternoon? I'm doing really well, actually. It's still morning over here, just for another hour, and it's a little gloomy where I am in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah, I think you are four hours behind my time, which is really cool. So tell us, like, which of your talents is responsible for us connecting at this specific time in history? I think it would be my writing, my book. I know you are interviewing or you have interviewed my co-author, John Lim. He and I wrote a book called Making Fake Star Trek. And uh, we're just releasing in a month, we are releasing our second book, Making More Fake Star Trek. And both these books are about, it, it's a behind the scene memoir about the making of a Star Trek fan film. Just kind of a, a funny look at the chaos behind recreating Star Trek with two of Star Trek's original stars, Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov, and uh, George Takei, who played Sulu. That's super cool. I mean, like, how does it feel, though, like, seeing the work that you've done? Because you've been on the camera before, right? But to see what this has evolved into with the book and even the podcast, how does that make you feel? Really amazing. I mean, I never would have thought that would, <laughs> would have happened. We, we filmed these 15 years ago, and they were fun to film at the time. And, and as a Star Trek fan, it was amazing to get to interact with Walter and, and interact with George and, and be a part of, even though we call it affectionately, fake Star Trek. It was still amazing to be creating Star Trek with these legends that I grew up watching. But then I thought, that's it. You know, it, it's a cool little thing to have on my credits on my, as an actor, to have on my resume. And John and I have kept in touch, joking about the times we had making these episodes. But I I never in my wildest dreams ever thought that eventually a decade and a half later he and I would sit down and write them into books I never thought I'd get to write a book I've always kind of wanted to write a book it's been a dream of mine but to, to get to do it and to have it come out and to have people enjoy it as much as they have really just feels amazing wow. now in the midst of Star Trek there's a ton of value in time travel and you're expressing here even your experience with a decade and a half plus or minus a bit what's happening now is that a talent that you seen that you may have which is that ability to be mindful and create things and not have to stress on it that much is that accurate is that something you've seen in your life it's something I, mean, I try to do. I try to, to focus on now and to not stress over the past or worry about the future and just be mindful of the present and, and try to enjoy life as it comes at me. Because, yeah, I, I've, I've had some luck in my life and I've had some great moments in my life. And now I have a family and I'm very happy and I've got wonderful kids and a wife. And so it's something I try to be mindful of, of just relishing every moment as it comes to me and, and trying not to stress too much. I'm not perfect by any stretch, so I certainly stress quite a bit, but I try not to. Who did you learn that from, that ability to reflect and make decisions going forward? Um, I think I definitely get my optimism from my mother. Hmm. And um, there's been other people who've come and gone in my life who've taught me the similar values of being patient. And now I practice Zen Buddhism. And that certainly teaches to focus on the now and to be patient with people and to accept things as they are. And, you know, things are neither good nor bad. We have the power to make them good or bad. So hmm. I try to be that. And I try to live that way. And, and I, I'll credit my mom more than anyone for giving me that kind of disposition. Well, tell me one other thing that you've done consistently over the last three years, please. I make dinner for my family. That's very consistent. So. That's huge. You are laughing like that's an easy thing. Like this is the best I could come up with. That's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it's a constant in life. And it's one that I definitely take for granted. <laughs> it probably even annoys me at times, but it's a good thing. It's to, to get to bring the family together and, and make a dinner and feed my family and be responsible for what is typically in life an important moment in everyone's day is that, that dinner time um, moment, conversation, whatever it happens to be, relaxing in the evening, watching TV with the family. Mm -hmm. I'd say another consistency over three years has been the book that I've been writing with John, the two books. He and I started it probably, I think, three years ago in April. So mm -hmm. that's been a, a really consistent part of my life for the last three years and I guess I foolishly didn't think it would take three years to write a book and originally we set out to write only one book but it happened to be so big that we had to cut it into two parts and I never thought that three years later we're still editing it we, we've got a month until release and, and the second book is still being edited that's been a major part of my life for the last three years how does it make you feel to see that seed grow into what it is now how does it make you feel with the book 
Oh, it feels so great. Because originally, I suggested to John as a joke that we should write a book. And I floated it as a joke because I really wanted to write a book. I had put acting aside so that I could raise my family. And I was looking into writing screenplays. But writing and selling screenplays is difficult in Hollywood today. And a lot of other writers suggested, you know, you write a book first, and then maybe that turns into a fodder for a screenplay. And so I kind of wanted to write a book, but it always seemed like an impossible task. And so I kind of floated that as a joke to see what John's response might be. And he thought it was a great idea. So I abandoned the joke aspect of it and said, yeah, let's write a book. <laughs> and we jumped right into it. It does feel like a monumental accomplishment and I couldn't be prouder of it. And I'm I'm thankful that John didn't laugh at my joke that we should write a book and embraced it instead, because I can't imagine writing it with anyone other than John. So just to someone that's listening, why they should, you know, possibly make one joke, right? And then follow through on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it worked out. So I would suggest to anyone listening that if there's something they really want to do and then they find someone, I found John and I knew I could rely on him to push me along in writing the book. That sometimes a task is so much easier when you've got help. I mean, oftentimes a task is so much easier when you've got help. So mm. find someone you can rely on, ask them for help or even suggestingly joke <laughs> they yeah. could help you with it. And you'd be surprised. I mean, it starts a journey that you could never imagine where it would land yeah i love that i love that again amazing audience you're hearing it live from andy bray folks well i know there are some nerds that listen to the podcast right there are the star trek fans, right so yes interesting yep. right making fake star trek.com you can find everything you need right there let's switch gears for a moment this is the part of the conversation where we attempt to connect the dots to who you are and who you were please tell us what was your earliest childhood memory Huh. One of my earliest memories is performing on stage in kindergarten. So I was five years old and we were doing the night before Christmas and I was playing the part of one of the sleeping kids. All the kids are supposed to fall asleep. There were probably about a dozen of us who were supposed to fall asleep on stage. And then Santa Claus comes out onto the stage and takes us all off stage. And our teacher stressed to us, do not close your eyes. Keep them open so you can see when Santa Claus comes out on stage. That's your cue to get off the stage. But I... Even as a five-year-old, I wanted my performance to be very realistic. And I wanted to sell to the audience that I'm asleep. I'm sleeping. And so I closed my eyes because, you know, that was the more realistic way to perform sleeping. And so I closed my eyes. And, of course, I completely missed the cue. I didn't see Santa Claus coming out on stage. Everybody else, all the other kids, got up off stage, walked <laughs> off stage, left me by myself. And I got my first ever laugh. And I think after that, I was hooked. <laughs> and I, I immediately wanted to be an actor and I immediately wanted to be a comedic actor. That's intriguing. How do you see it connecting metaphorically? I mean, this is like the improv moment, right? Like, how do you see that connecting to who you are today? Well, I mean, if I connected the dots, it, it led to me then pursuing acting in school, in middle school, and then high school. And then because of my love of acting, I moved straight out from Miami and came straight out to Los Angeles as soon as I graduated in high school because I wanted to immediately start pursuing acting. And, you know, an actor's life is a hard life. And so I needed a roommate. You know, I lived in a small one bedroom apartment for a stretch of time. And my roommate, Subash, he needed a place to stay too. He, he lived on my futon in my mm. apartment. And he's the one who had a friend who gave him breakdown services, which as an actor is like the holy grail. This mm. is the listings of all the auditions happening every single day. They release them every single day. And he found one for a play, a stage play called Spock's Brain which was being produced by Paramount Pictures, the folks who own Star Trek. And it was supposed to be a word-for-word a -word recreation of what's considered the worst episode of the original Star Trek, Spock's mm -hmm. Brain, but played for laughs. And Subash convinced me to audition for it. I auditioned for the part of Chekhov. I got it. It ended up being a big success down in Orange County. We took it to Las Vegas, where they have the big yearly Star Trek convention every year. We happened to perform on the same day that Walter Koenig, who played Chekhov, was there. The actor Gabe Tiani, who played Spock, convinced me to talk to Walter and get him to come to our performance. Walter came. Walter loved it. Little did I know at that time, Walter was in talks with the producers of Star Trek New Voyages, the fan film, to play Chekhov, to do an episode with them. And they needed a young Chekhov. He suggested me having seen wow. me in the play so that this is the perfect guy to play Chekhov that got me into the fan film that's how I met John I did that episode then we did that it was a big success we did the George Takei episode I did one more after that John got me into doing online dating which is how I met my future wife wow. and now how I have my kids so I mean it's funny how you look back at your life and you can find the little dots that connect the little threads of a tapestry you, you take one out and the entire rug falls apart and John who's gone on to become my best friend and he and I and I writing a book and I'm finding new legs and a new career as a writer as a result. So it's crazy. The little dots that connect. Yeah. And then he connected us and here we are today, right? Having this conversation. It's really, really cool. All right, my friend. If we fast forward to when you were 12 years old, what was your favorite song? 
at 12 years old, my favorite song would have been Weird Al Yankovic's Eat It. Weird Al Yankovic is a parody artist. He takes actual musicians and he takes their music and he does funny lyrics to it, parodies. Oh, that's and amazing. Eat It is based on Michael Jackson's Beat It, but with yeah. funny words like, na 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 na, eat it, just eat it, <laughs> put it in the microwave and reheat it. <laughs> and as a 12 year old, I was obsessed with Weird Al. <laughs> in fact, that was the first concert I ever went to in high school was a Weird Al Yankovic concert. And I stayed afterwards to meet him and, and get an autograph. Hmm. It's just amazing, right? Again, it connects, right? <laughs> Improv, comedy, yeah, everything. Absolutely. It Absolutely. just connects. Well, that's wonderful. All right. Well, we've arrived at our destination. Next up, we have a declaration form. Yes or no? Probably a bit more. Andy, have you chosen someone to pass on your skills to? Well, my son, my middle son, Jude, has shown an interest in writing and acting. And in fact, he's doing a, a video for Star StarTrek.com on Saturday. Uh, and he and his brother, Malcolm, my youngest, they, they starred in a commercial for Making Fake Star Trek, the book that he, I, I directed, wow. I, <laughs> where they're basically chiding me and making fun of me as the uncool dad who's trying desperately to please the, his kids with, with, hey, I wrote a book, I wrote a book, and they couldn't care less. And <laughs> and, <laughs> and Jude has actually also shown an interest in, in writing, and, and I actually, uh, he and I wrote an we wrote a, uh, a kids book together that we're still in the process of editing and refining. And I don't know when it might come out. We, we still have to do the illustrations for it. But uh, he's definitely shown an interest in, in, in both writing and acting. That's super cool. My friend, you're absolutely amazing. You spoke about you being married. So my wife is there, right? And yes. in the midst of things, you know, there are questions that I would usually ask on my podcast, but it's evolving, right? Where asking the questions I would ask no longer feel as great because of these other questions that I want to ask, right? <laughs> so you know how that goes. But yeah, Absolutely. I mean, like, well done in terms of what you're doing. I really appreciate you coming on to the podcast to have a conversation with me. Again, amazing audience, making a fake Star Trek dot com. Or you could check out andybray.com, right? To find yeah. more information as well theandybray.com and i'm also on on twitter yeah because there's actually a famous british cricket player named andy bray who knew so i've got yeah competition for the name but on twitter i'm at the andy bray on instagram i'm at andy bray author and they can they can check me out there too oh, wonderful andy again a great pleasure my friend a pleasure i treasure thank you for being on what is inspired by 12 minute convos with angel jones this podcast is produced by Pod Edits. Visit podedits.com for professional podcast publishing.